Do you believe in life after we're all vaccinated? Cher, the one and only Cher, and our friend and regular Dr. Erwin Redliner say yes. And with superstar power aiding in the fight to get everyone eligible their COVID vaccine shots through their pandemic resource and response fund, they are helping underserved communities with minimal access to medical protection and care. Today, they are in Harlem, meeting people where they are in partnership with New York City, where they've launched a Share Cares bus to help vaccinate and test as many people as possible. Joining us now, Grammy, Emmy, and Academy Award winning singer and icon Cher, as well as MSNBC public health analyst, Dr. Erwin Redliner, founding director of Columbia University's National Center for Disaster Preparedness. Of course, Claire's still here. Cher, thank you so much for doing this. I'm so excited, here. you guys. I'm so excited to see you and Claire, and I wish I was there. I wish you were here, too. This is our first day back Me at too. the table. Me too. <laughs> All of us. Too. Hi, hi, yeah, hi, hi, Cher. So we'll talk about, I want to talk about everything you're doing, but how, how is your life? Are you feeling like life is back to normal for you? Well, you know, I still feel like I need to wear a mask when I go outside. I just have that feeling. And now with the Me India, too. <laughs> yes, I just, I just feel, you know, I've been vaccinated and all that, but I have that just little, I don't know how long. Also, I'm going to tell you something. Wearing a mask is so cool for me because I can go anywhere and nobody knows who I am. It also, you know, covers up all the, you know, 15 months for me without hair and makeup. I want to ask you about taking, I mean, from the very beginning, before we even knew we'd have a vaccine, this need to go into communities and serve people where they live was a known sort of hole. And you're helping to fill it. How did that come to be? It was up, it was Erwin. Erwin and I have been working together for quite a little time, but I have just trusted him because I, I just believe he's a really good person. And of course he knows everything. So I wanted to work with him. And so that my money was going to go in the places that it would make the most good that it would, you know. Or you've been invoked, Dr. Redliner. I How heard did that you? I'm blushing. <laughs> <laughs> you are. <laughs> Yes, I'm yes. Then hide behind Claire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How, so how did you how did you guys sort of collaborate on this idea of the Share Cares van? So Cher reached out to me quite a long time ago now and said she wanted to do something. This is we had no vaccine at that point. We just had a lot of people suffering, a lot of fatalities from COVID. And she said she wanted to donate like a million dollars, which was, you know, and uh, would I help her? Of course I would. But the thing that really impressed me, Nicole, is that she specifically wanted to help underserved communities. So we ended up, uh, you know, supporting the needs uh, in five uh, farmer clinics in Central California, rural clinics in Arkansas and Mississippi, uh, keeping daycare programs open with boys and girls clubs in various parts of the country. And now this uh, new mobile unit that's going to be vaccinating people. It's been a remarkable example of what somebody could do if they have resources and they really want to help. This has been absolutely remarkable. Uh, Cher is a hero to the United States. And, and, I, and I think an example of, yes, it's a problem, but we all have a role to play. And Cher certainly has played her role incredibly well. And Cher, there's a lot of optimism in the choice you made. And I think a lot of doctors have been careful to try to help us understand that there's a real difference between hardcore anti-vaxxers and people that are scared people that can't take a day off work to go get it, people who don't know where to go get it. And, and this van seems to be addressing really the needs of that group. But you know what? I was afraid too. you know, I was a late, I was a late vacciner. You know, I just was like, Oh, do I want to do this? And then I thought, well, you're just so stupid. You have to do this, you know? And, <laughs> and I, everybody that I know, I just took everybody that I, that I knew and forced them. Yeah, there is this comfort in, in numbers. Um, I know you're a big political um, junkie. I know you know and follow all the debates going on. And I, and I wanted to ask you if you are sleeping better at night with President Biden in office. I am. You know, I love him. I've known him since, what, 2006, and I just love him. But I have to tell you something. I This is going to really sound weird, maybe, but I have, like, I get really sick to my stomach and like I have a real problem uh when I feel that things are like every time Trump does something like sometimes I just have to stop watching the news because I just get 
overwhelmed and they get angry and then I get sick. Well, I look, I, I have to say, I, I hear that from, from a lot of my friends and people that say, I'm, I'm sorry, but I, I can't watch all of it. And I wonder if that's because in some ways we thought it was all Trump, but it's depressing to see that millions of people and just about everyone in Congress, except for a couple people, maybe Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger, see the world the way he did. I had a friend. She wasn't a close friend. She just was an acquaintance. She worked for the FBI and she infiltrated these groups. And um, and this was like five years old. I mean, five years ago when I talked to her. And um, she said, you know, the one thing that's good is that they all hate each other. She said, but if someone could join them together, it would be terrible. And that's all I kept thinking. Yeah. Yeah. When you see the insurrection and you certainly see the um, Justice Department charging these groups, it certainly looks like they all came together that day. Yeah. And everybody knew. I mean, the Republicans knew. But, you know, you you just have to keep going and you have to do what you can do. You know, you just have to you can't give up. You know, I, I know about I know about not giving up. I, I just am a person who has been through the most unbelievable downtimes in my life. People don't really realize that. But at one thing I know, it's like I'm a bumper car. If I hit a wall, I come back up and I go another direction. It's so important. It's so invaluable. I want to bring my friend Claire into the conversation. Claire has a question for you. Uh, Cher. Hello, Claire. I'm so happy to see you. I am so, but listen, I'm, I'm, I'm a little tongue tied <laughs> in your presence. I am uh, this is starstruck. <laughs> I am definitely starstruck. You know, there, there seems to be a pattern of strong, smart women who have entertained us with glorious talent over the years stepping up in this crisis. I look at you and I look at Dolly Parton and others. And what can you say to your fellow talented artists out there? Because I think some of them are so afraid about sticking their neck out that it'll get bitten off. What can you say to them about how you just take up the reins and make something happen like you have? Well, if I wasn't on TV, I would say this differently, but uh, (laughs) you just got to do it. I mean, you have to man up or girl up or whatever, because like, what are you going to use your celebrity for? You know, it's not just all about makeup and being naked and, you know, wearing a few beads. And it's, <laughs> it's, you just got to, you've got to do it. You owe it. We get like, I have had a charmed life, you know, and I'm really this many years old. And, and um, so if you don't do it, what's the good? I mean, like, what have you been killing yourself for it. You have to, you have to do these things, you know, you have to help people. And um, my mother taught me when I was young, because we were poor, but my mother, once I was complaining that my shoes were all scuffed up and I'd worn to the bottom. And my mother said, yes, but did you hear about the man who complained about his, his shoes until he saw the man who had no feet that I heard that a million times growing up. I think you just answered this for us, but I, I wonder if you could just talk about your hopes for all of us on the other side of the pandemic. Well, I I just think like this little bit of being able to go out, like just hearing, you know, like I'm going to meet my friends and we weren't going to be able to go until like we just found out. And my one friend has a boat and so we we go with her on the vacation. I've missed the last two. But it, the freedom of it and being able to get in countries, you know, like to be able to go into countries where countries that, you know, countries you've been in, countries I've lived in and not be allowed, you know. But also, you know, the, in in some instances, we're not going to be able to give shows because we need to get insurance, Mm. And so there's really no way to do it. So we're trying to figure out, you know, how that's going to come together. 